This gentleman is going to go on and he's going to go on a very, very, very deep dive in regards to the origins and history of Mike Bickle. Okay. So I'm, I'm not going to like go through this entire video because it's like 25 minutes long. And again, it's pretty much just a history lesson. So what, what do I want us to conclude or what rather, what does God want us to conclude about this specific clip? Well, first off, this is the classic guilty by association thing. Do I believe that guilty by association uh, is relevant. I, I think, yeah, sure. To some extent saying that uh, a leader is guilty uh, of potentially being a false teacher because of the people that he backs can be a thing. Do I think it is most of the time? I say no, because uh, a lot of times th when I hear these kinds of things, it's so-and-so did a podcast with so-and-so, therefore the first person's a false teacher because he associated with him. Well, what if that was an opportunity for him to preach the gospel to him? Or so-and-so was speaking at the same conference as so-and-so. Therefore, they're a false teacher. Again, makes little to no sense. Uh, that clip that you just watched of Francis Chan there is specifically in reference to Francis being at the uh, the Send conference. This was a handful of years ago. That's what the, the whole point of the thing was about, though. It was about him at the Send concert. And uh, my problem with that is, uh, first off, he even mentioned, he said, you know, Benny, I'm not even going to talk about Benny. He said, I'm just really not familiar with Benny that much. And uh, if you would have seen, you know, at the Sin Conference, Benny Hinn just kind of like surprised everybody at the end. I don't, I don't think anybody knew he was going to be there. He wasn't on the roster of speakers, etc. So Benny Hinn was kind of irrelevant to the entire conversation. Um, but for specifically Mike Bickle, I have never seen or heard Mike Bickle do anything that would be considered, uh, would consider him a false teacher. So I think it might be important for us to define what is a false teacher. Well, a false teacher is somebody who is not teaching things that are scripturally incorrect. If you want to use that as like a universal phrase, that's fine, I suppose. But at the end of the day, the massive problem with using a phrase like this for a false teacher is you're accusing somebody of generally being a false convert or a, a wolf in sheep's clothing or condemned. The, the point is, is that you think that this person is not going to spend an eternity with Christ because of the way that they live. And that's what I see as a huge issue when we're talking about Francis Chan because he associates with Mike Bickle. I don't have any reason to believe that Mike Bickle is a, a condemned at all. And to me, again, that seems very strange to go as far as to say that he's condemned. Um, do I believe that, that uh, Mike Bickle believes false teachings? Yes. In this video, they're going to dive into a bunch of false teachings that Mike Bickle happens to believe. And I agree that we should not believe those false teachings that this are, you know, that are associated here. But then to say that he is a false teacher in the sense of he is not going to go to heaven one day is where I have a serious issue. They're trying to right now go through this deep dive into this uh, the Seven Mountains theology, which I guess IHOP believes in, which I did not know. And again, he's doing right now another classic guilty by association. He's mixing Benny Hinn in the mix and uh, Chuck Pierce and all of these different people. Again, I think it's really hard for you to say because somebody else believes this theology over here and this guy believes this theology over here. Therefore, both people are false teachers. Or, or, or the first person is a false teacher because the second one is. That's like saying that I am a false teacher because I'm charismatic. Uh, Kenneth Copeland is also charismatic. Therefore, since we're both charismatic, we're both false teachers. That's a really far stretch to make. And that's what you're doing when you're associating somebody with somebody else like that. So Mike Bickle, again, have no reason to believe that he would be spending an eternity apart from Christ if he died today, even in the context of this new scandal thingy that he's a part of, or, you know, potential allegations to be a part of, I would say the same thing to him uh, in that context. Um, I don't think that it would be enough or reasonable or justifiable enough for you to say that somebody's going to spend eternity in hell because of that one thing. Again, I believe that would be a very far and extreme fetch to make just because of a, a supposed allegation. If this was an ongoing lifestyle that was unrepentant, that's a different conversation. Uh, he claims to have had been with a woman. If you don't know about this, he, he you know, had had sexual misconduct with a woman years and years ago. Um, so guilty by association, especially when we're talking about somebody like Mike Bickle. I, I, I'm not like familiar with all of his teachings, obviously, but I've listened to quite a bit by Mike Bickle. I don't believe him to be a false teacher. Francis Chan, don't believe him to be a false teacher for associating with these people. Um, You've also got to consider when somebody like a Francis Chan is being requested to speak at a specific conference or something like that, you cannot expect somebody like him to be familiar with all of the different people uh, who he's going to be, you know, or, or all the different theologies of the person he's going to be speaking with. I think that would be an extreme expectation of these people. Uh, you know, you understand what they fundamentally believe. Cool. Can we still fellowship together? Or is this person a false convert going to hell, wolf in sheep's clothing, deceiver? And that's where I believe that this person falls short of at least accusing Francis on those matters. Now, this is a much more realistic one in the second clip we're about to watch. And this one is going to be in reference to the topic of salvation and eternity and predominantly the gospel. So let's watch this clip of uh, probably about a decade, decade and a half ago, maybe, of Francis Chan speaking at the church he used to pastor. Who over and over said, repent, turn. You need to be born again. You got to start this thing all over. You got to die to yourself. 
That's what Jesus taught. People say, well, but John 3.16, John 3.16 says, God's all over the world, that whoever believes in him, keep reading. John 3.36 says, he who, who believes in the Son who has life, he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, and the wrath of God abides on him. Just keep reading. Francis fails to understand the way in which an individual obeys the gospel. Romans chapter 10 verse 16 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath what? Believed our report. According to this passage, the gospel is obeyed when the gospel is believed. Don't miss that. We obey the gospel. How? By believing the gospel, trusting the gospel, putting our faith in the gospel, trusting in who Christ is and what Christ did for us. He died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Are you trusting in that or someone or something else? At so this is a really classic, you know, argument of, of are we saved by grace through faith uh, alone or are we saved by repentance and faith? What is the actual aspect of salvation? What is the thing that gets us saved? Well, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not of our own works, lest any man should boast, but it is a free gift of God unto salvation. With that context, um, that would clarify that we cannot work our way into heaven. If you were to ask Francis Chan, though, hey, do you believe that you can work your way into heaven? I think that you would get a very clear and resounding no from him, that you cannot work your way into uh, to, to, to heaven. Uh, he would agree with that. Uh, he would say that you need to repent and believe the gospel, which some people like debate is lordship salvation. But he would never say anything about you needing to do something to be saved. And again, I don't know any repentance and faith person who preaches repentance and faith versus just grace through faith who would say that you have to do something to make it to heaven one day. I've never heard anybody say that ever. So, so what's the difference here? Again, I, I think that we're really arguing uh, new, or excuse me, we're arguing semantics here. And somebody like this gentleman right here, I think he's really misrepresenting Francis Chan. If you want to disagree with somebody and call them out as a false teacher or whatever, you have the liberty to do that. But it would be wise for you to understand what they believe first. Um, I think that that would be a way better if you could tell somebody that, uh, you know, hey, I disagree with what you're saying and here's what you're actually saying. But he's not even saying what, what Francis Chan is saying. Francis Chan would say faith without works is dead. And that would be his basis upon the John 336 verse that he mentioned about if you do not obey that you are uh, condemned. And again, I, I don't know who would just really who would disagree with that point unless you're trying to mischaracterize his uh, belief system into saying that he believes that works merit salvation, which again is an entirely different thing to say, then that would be way, way, way different than saying that you just believe that repentance and faith is required. This is why uh, Church of Christ type people say that you are a uh, Christian by your grace and faith and also salvation, or excuse me, also baptism. But they don't believe that baptism is a work. They believe that baptism is an act of grace. So if we as Christians believe that you have been saved by grace through faith, yet they get baptized and say it's required for salvation, who's right? Well, theologically and scripturally teaching, uh, uh, speaking, excuse me, they're wrong. You don't have to be baptized to go to heaven one day. With that being said, are they condemned for preaching a works-based salvation? No, I wouldn't say that they're going to hell because they're preaching a works-based salvation. I believe simply that these people who are saying this kind of thing, they're just in their zeal and in their understanding believing that baptism was an act of grace because they don't dunk themselves, somebody else dunks them. So then they're saying that that is kind of like an aspect of the grace through, through faith uh, moment and that baptism is a part of you doing that. Again, I have no problem with this. I don't know. Again, it, it's wrong, but when I say I have no problem, I mean like in regards to somebody's salvation. And by the way, Francis Chan doesn't even believe that, but I'm just trying to make a comparison here to you saying that somebody is spending an eternity apart from Jesus and then you saying, uh, you know, that somebody is, you know, potentially just got a poor theology. And in the same scenario, I would say the same thing here about Francis Chan. I'm not going to play this because it's like a, you know, 45 minute long sermon, but we see here, this is uh, Francis Chan and he is speaking at, uh, you know, his church uh, congregation that he speaks at. And I've watched this sermon personally myself. And he talks about the importance and the centrality of communion. What he means by this is that the Lord's Supper was something that was taken very seriously by the people in uh, the early church, the Didache. We see this Acts 2, Acts 4. The breaking bread from house to house was an extremely important part of their walk with Jesus and their fellowship as the accused of is 
uh, that he is either Catholic or pro-Catholic, or he believes in transubstantiation or something like that. And uh, the answer to those things, again, would be no, he, he, he's not. He's taking seriously the words of Jesus about communion, taking seriously us remembering what Jesus did on the cross, and also seeing the importance and value that Catholics put on communion. They take communion far more seriously than us Christians do. Just call a spade a spade. Um, does that mean that their theology is better than ours? Does that mean transubstantiation is right? No, but that does mean that they take with more reverence by and large, like the Catholic church at large, than the Protestant church does. We at the Protestant church don't take um, communion as seriously as we ought to. And I think that this is definitely to our disadvantage, like massively to our disadvantage that we don't take communion as seriously because it was a very serious thing to the early church and it should be a very serious thing to us. But because he talks about the bread, uh, the blood and body of Jesus, then he just gets automatically, you know, sectioned in with the Catholics, especially since somebody like him is, as we mentioned, spending some time around people who are Catholic. Here's the difference between uh, Francis Chan and I believe most people. In closing, I want to give my real thoughts on, on Francis Chan. He seems like an incredible man of God who has words for the global body of Christ that are extremely relevant. Another person I would put in the same category would be John Bevere. And like they are always very relevant, very on point, very convicting. And he is looking to make the body of Christ look more as God has called them to. I mean, it, it's as simple as that. How, how are you not going to amen and amen that? Does that mean that every theological point Francis Chan mentions is right? Nope, definitely not. Definitely has things that he believes that are not correct. You and me also have things that we believe that are incorrect. The difference in Francis Chan and most people, though, is he has the spiritual maturity and the humility, first off, to change his views. But second off, and this is the part I really want you to get. He has the ability to acknowledge his incorrect views and to repent from those views and learn from somebody who has bad theology sometimes. Most people don't have the humility to just change their view anyways. If they do, they definitely won't do it from somebody whose theology they don't already line up with. Let me give you an example. The likelihood of a cessationist, by and large, and again, I'm definitely painting with a broad brush. Not everybody falls into this category. The likelihood of a cessationist hearing a word from a charismatic and saying, I repent from my incorrect views about something other than charismatic stuff and saying, you know what? You're right about this topic about how I need to crucify my flesh or, you know, how, how I can seek Jesus deeper or how I can be more free from sin than I am today. Very rare are you going to hear a cessationist say that because they're only going to listen to somebody like a charismatic oftentimes just to hear what they can disagree with. Spiritual maturity is you being able to listen to somebody you disagree with and still learn something from them. I hope you heard that. Spiritual maturity is when you can listen to somebody who you disagree with and still learn something from them. If you're going to cast stones at a Francis Chan or somebody else like that because they have certain views that you don't agree with, so you can't associate yourself with them, fellowship with them, or learn from them, that is a sign of spiritual maturity. I find that we have a lot of baby Christians out there who are still on spiritual milk because they are quarreling among each other. These are the, these are the words of Paul, by the way. I, I didn't come up with this myself, right? Uh, Paul says that if you can't even be in one accord together with other believers who are different in theology than you, right? Uh, the, the guys, can, can I remind you that the whole aspect of being in one accord is in context of people who are hard to be in one accord with. Uh, obviously, Paul wouldn't be saying to be one accord with people who's easy to be one accord with. It'd be very easy to be in one accord with somebody who's easy to be in one accord with. This is 1 Corinthians 3. It says, brothers and sisters, uh, could not I speak to you as only spirit, or I, I could, or sisters could not speak to you as spiritual people, but only as fleshly, as infants, babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, and you were not able to consume it. But even now you are still not able to, for you are still fleshly. Whoa, come on. Can't can we hear like a proverb? Can't we hear like an encouraging word, brother? That's not the day. But even now, some of you are not, or you're still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking as ordinary people? As in like non-believing people. So for one of you says that I'm charismatic. One of you says that I'm a cessationist. One of you says that I'm a Calvinist. Are you not fleshly people? Are you not ordinary people? What is a charismatic? What is a Paul? All are servants whom have believed even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. A charismatic may have even watered. And, and, and guess what? You, you may have even had an Arminius be the one who planted. But God was one who caused the increase. The one who planted, the one who watered is nothing. You are nothing. But God deserves the glory who did all of the actual work. Obviously, I know it said Apollos and Paul and Cephas there. But you get the point I'm trying to make, hopefully. 
that for you to say, I cannot associate or I'm not going to agree with you or I'm, I'm going to pick the side of, of charismatics for my fellowship people, horribly toxic. Jesus is waiting to come back to a perfect bride that is in full unity with each other. John 13, 35, they will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. John 17, that they will know that I am from the Father by the way that you love one another. We're not doing a really good job right now to show the lost world that we are a people all together and that we're all following the same Jesus when everybody and anyone's a heretic just because we disagree on secondary, tertiary type issues. Hopefully we can stop condemning somebody who does not have false beliefs about the gospel, about the things that are important in context of eternity, and Francis Chan simply does not fit in that category. So is Francis Chan a false teacher? No. Does he believe some things that are false? Sure. So do you and me. But to call him a false teacher, I believe, is extremely spiritually immature and unbiblical. If this has been of any benefit,